Welcome to today's Southwest Zone Town Hall meeting. Um, uh, my name is Joe Linnan. I'm with USA Water Polo, Texas Development. Today we are speaking with Coaches Club admins who make up the Southwest Zone Events Committee. We will have a roundtable discussion on the upcoming zone events and Southwest uh, Run events and the USA Water Polo National uh, Junior Olympics. This will be a panel style discussion, so I will call on each of the panelists with a few questions on a variety of topics. Yeah, we're kind of related specifically to the Southwest Zone events, tournaments, and game days. For those attending and watching the session, please feel free to ask questions with the Q&A feature, and I will make sure your questions get answered. A couple quick announcements. Um, we have the Southwest Zone calendar at southwestwaterpolo.org, which is the Southwest Zone website. Um, so um, I know earlier today I put up on the calendar, we have some, some kind of upcoming events. John Abdu and USA Waterpolo are doing a return to play Kind of, a, kind, of, kind of a coach's safety guidelines. That'll be this upcoming Saturday, August 8th. There will be the Texas Water Polo Clinic in North Texas on August 11th through 13th. That's gonna be hosted by Pegasus and Thunder. You're gonna have Adam Wright and Merrill Moses from UCLA and Pepperdine accordingly that, that, that are gonna be there as well as Max Irvine and Mark Farmer, or uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Matt Farmer from uh, the USA Water Polo National Teams. Um, and. All the, and all the information for that camp is at the Southwest Zone calendar. Um, also, there will be a USA Water Polo Beginner Referee Clinic on Sunday, August 30th. That's with our national referee, LaVon, and also our uh, Southwest Zone referee, Angela Una. And all the events are at the Southwest Zone calendar, which is at southwestwaterpolo.org. Okay, at this time, I'm going to go around the horn here, and I'm, and I'm going to each of our uh, panelists kind of introduce themselves. They're going to say what club they're from, kind of where their club is located, what are their roles on their club, kind of how long they've been with the club, and any other roles that they've had here in the water pool world. So we're just going to go around the horn. How about Taylor Cox? Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Taylor Cox. I'm with Southside Water Polo Club. Uh, we cover the Pearland and South Houston area. I am a co-owner of the club as well as a head coach since the club's start in 2017. Um, so I am a coach. I'm also a high school referee. Um, under Topo, and I do uh, some USA water polo stuff here and there, um, working with the zone. Allie Hill. Hi, I'm Allie Hill. I work with Longhorn Aquatics, which is based in Austin. I've been with the club for about two years now, and I mainly coach the 16 and 18 new girls teams. My other roles, I've also worked with the Lhasa High School teams, which are also based in Austin. Okay. Brandon Dion. Hi, uh, I'm Brandon Dion. I am with Thunderwater Polo Club. We kind of are in the like Northwest quadrant of the Metroplex, uh, kind of out in the suburbs, um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I am the club admin uh, and one of the coaches for Thunder. Um, and then, yeah. Do this and coach high school. Spencer Dornan. Yeah, hi, Spencer Dornan from Pegasus Water Polo Academy. We're based in Central Dallas. Um, been at the club for four years. Uh, head coach, and then run most of the day-to-day -day operations. Okay, um, I do appreciate that. The one member of the committee that could not be here tonight is Scott Slay. He is actually the chair of the committee. He's also a Southwest Zone board member. He's also the, like, the club director and co-head coach for the West Houston Water Polo Club, also known as the Viper Pigeons. And he's currently a, um, also a head coach out in Katy ISD. And he used to coach at Foster um, High School in, South, um, in South, uh, Southwest Houston. So, um, so again, the five people are Scott Slay, Taylor Cox, Brandon Dion, Spencer Dornan, and Allie Hill. All right, so now we're just going to go through a few questions here. It's going to be open up kind of the group to kind of give their input in here. The first question is, what is the Southwest Zone Events Committee? Southwest Zone Events Committee is a, is a subcommittee of the Southwest Zone Board. The Southwest Zone Board is in charge of kind of running all the, all the different development and events and such in the Southwest Zone. The Southwest Zone is made up of Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. The Southwest Zone Events Committee specifically is in charge of operating the, um, the uh, what's it called, uh, the Southwest Zone specifically run events. And those include the tax tournaments, the NGO quals tournaments. Um, there, is a, there is a master's tournament in like kind of February. And, they, and that is, any, is that everything from just uh, kind of securing pool time to um, 
kind of kind of working with hosts and, and making sure all the entry fees come in and kind of and kind of setting schedules and then the second uh, kind of primary uh, directive of the Southwest Zone Events Committee is is kind of is kind of setting the Southwest Zone calendar, and that's and that is going to be working with the local club host as far as the tournaments throughout the year. And we are going to have a lot of changes here coming up on the on the Southwest Zone calendar, but that's a general overview of the uh, uh, like just kind of like of the committee. So, any did I miss anything, guys? No, I think you covered it. Okay, so um, each of the uh, each each of the people here that are going to be um, um, are talking are going to talk about their specific role on the on the Southwest Zone uh, like kind of events committee. Um, Scott Slay is not here. He again is the chair and he's also the zone board member, kind of a representative on the committee. Like the, like the chairman of the of the committee acts as the supervisor of the committee and yeah, and is in charge of meetings and and kind of sets meetings. So the, the communication within the group and assist all the other members as needed. So now um, I'm just going to go down the list here. And first up, uh, Taylor Cox and her job is communications. Yes, yeah, so um, with communications, I'm charged with uh, making sure that I communicate the zone events uh, throughout the zone to all the other clubs. Uh, I also help with collecting bid packets, um, which is kind of a lengthy process that we go through whenever we are doing Southwest Zone events. I also work on sending reminders about deadlines, including like financial deadlines, as well as uh, tournament entry deadlines. And then also um, I'm working on ensuring accurate documentation of club contacts uh, throughout the zone. So making sure that we have the most up-to-date contacts so that when we're reaching out to clubs about different events, we're reaching out to the right people. Okay, and now uh, Brendan Dion with scheduling. Yeah, so I oversee scheduling. Uh, my position kind of oversees the bid process, um, all the soliciting, uh, finalizing of the events that the Southwest Zone hosts uh, with the local clubs that are hosting, um, providing the game schedules for the events, posting all the all the results and everything online, um, just kind of live updating during the event. So pretty simple. Okay. Spencer Dornan with Calendar. Yeah, my job is to basically update the online calendar uh, coordinate with the, um, the local hosting clubs to make sure that they are still on board and don't, don't need to make any changes from year to year. Obviously, we'll be having a big change coming up um, when we move high school water polo into the fall. Um, and, um, yeah, and just making sure that it all runs smoothly and it's communicated out to uh, the public so they can see. Um, we do both um, USA-sanctioned uh, events and tournaments as well as uh, non-sanctioned stuff, such as high school, regional, and state tournaments, um, any uh, potential clinics and things like that. And Allie Hill with finances. Uh, right, so I deal with the financial aspect of Southwest Zone events. Um, that includes overseeing budgets, outlining pre-tournament expenses, reimbursements, payment of referees, uh, hosts after the event, and I'm also responsible for creating a summary and submitting it to the Southwest Zone Chair of all Southwest Zone funds. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, there are a lot of things that are going to be falling uh, kind of in the cracks, but this group also is getting together um, at least once a quarter to discuss any of the Southwest Zone events that are coming up or the ones that are passed and make decisions based off of you know, um, or decisions or recommendations to the Southwest Zone Board so we can have as accurate of a, a, of a counter and get the information out to teams as early as possible. So um, I do appreciate this is, yeah, for everybody that is, yeah, yeah, that is watching, if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask uh, kind of via the Q&A feature. But the Southwest Zone Events Committee is new here in 2020. Um, and Obviously, we, we really haven't had a whole lot of events to kind of host here over the last couple of months. So it's allowed us to get together and really kind of uh, kind of break down the various kind of duties. And um, um, historically, the Southwest Zone events, they start off as maybe one or two events a year, but now it's up to like about, about five or six different events a year. And it has historically been a couple of people that have been responsible for a lot of different, yeah, just kind of responsibilities. This is going to be something that these positions are appointed by the Southwest Zone Board, and this, I hope, is going to set us up for a, for a, for consistent long-term success. So, any questions as we go forward here, guys? 
Yeah, good. Okay. So now some other kind of questions are, what are some of the, of the Southwest Zone events? Um, I, I mean, I'll just answer this kind of real quick. Um, the Southwest Zone events are, they start with the Spin Lob Tournament, which is a master tournament in, yeah, in February. Then we have the Tag Spring Tournament, which is every April. That's for eighth grade and under kids or 14 and under kids. Um, and then we have the NGO Qualls Tournaments during the summer. We are now going to also, like, uh, uh, eventually we're also going to have a Tags Fall Championship as well. Um, that, again, is going to be for the younger age groups. Um, and then uh, we will also have uh, qualifiers for Champions Cup as needed. So those are the major events that are the Southwest Zone kind of run events. Um, the bid process, um, the, like the bid process is this, anybody can um, kind of host the Tags and the NJO Qualls. Um, and we've had plenty of people that have bid on these uh, kind of tournaments o like over the last couple of years. But um, do, you, do you guys want to share or give any insight about the events that, that you've either participated as far as a club is concerned or kind of, or kind of hosted yourself? Um, I mean, I, I can jump in about spin lob. You mentioned spin lob. So that was actually a tournament that the Southwest Zone co-hosted with um, Longhorn Aquatics and that was new this year. So that was the first time Southwest Zone and Longhorn Aquatics have partnered on that tournament the past year. Um, and essentially it's just kind of a way of streamlining events with the club, making sure that people um, are doing entry fees through the USA Water Polo portal, um, making sure the schedule is kind of done by like a bipartisan party, not by the host club. Um, and just kind of working together, make that uh, event run a little bit smoother. Uh, Taylor, I, I know that you guys have hosted some tags tournaments and some NGO quals before. Yeah, I was going to say, um, we've, we've been before uh, with Southside to host, like you said, um, NGO quals tags. And it's, I really like the process. I think that it's, um, it's a great process to go through because it really does make you evaluate the space that you have um, in order to be able to accommodate those large scale tournaments. So you uh, basically, as you're going through the packet, you have to figure out how much uh, room do I have for how, like how many courses can I run at a time? How many goals do I have access to? What do, what do the facilities look like? Do I have the hours that I need in order to run it through the facility? Just so that you're not scrambling at the last minute after you've already said, hey, I'll go ahead and I'll take this tournament. And now you're trying to figure out how you can actually make the tournament successful. Um, so I think that it's been a positive process that our zone is now going through in order to uh, receive these bids in order for people to say, yeah, we can actually feasibly host this and we do have the space and the time. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, to kind of piggyback on what on what Taylor's saying, um, I think it is easy to kind of get um, in over your head on some of these things. So it is kind of good to have somebody look at it for you. Um, I know for us, uh, uh, Thunder, I think it was two years ago, we hosted the Dallas Fall Invite. Um, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we ended up uh, running like five pool or five courses at two different pools. And it was like 112 games in two days. And it was awesome and we pulled it off, but we were beyond exhausted. We didn't realize, you know, because we had every club was like, yeah, we're going to enter four teams and we're going to enter five teams. And we're like, oh, yeah, no problem. Come on, come on, come on, you know. And so I think I think kind of having um, an experienced team that understands what it is to run these things and kind of help you out um, is, is definitely going to be helpful for anybody who's looking to run a tournament out there. Okay. All right, now we have a now we have a couple of questions uh, in yeah in the Q and A. The first question are: Are there designated points of contact for high school or CWPA? That's more for the calendar than anything else. But um, there aren't necessarily designated points of contact. Yeah, we have to sit there and talk to the various uh, like kind of coaches and go online and find out when the various uh, CWPA tournaments are. And we do add those to the Southwest Zone calendar each year. Um, the Southwest Zone calendar. Are, is broken down into if it's green, it's a it's a Southwest Zone um, kind of sanctioned event. If it's blue, it's a water pole. It, it's a major water pole event in this in the Southwest Zone. So, for example, um, we don't put all of the high school tournaments, but we put the major high school tournaments on that counter, like you know the region champs and the state championships. And we do try to put the CWPA tournaments for both men and women on there, just so whenever we 
have a calendar and the and uh, like there's a host that's kind of kind of looking to have an event well you may not want to put an event on the same weekend that there is a CD, uh, a collegiate water polo kind of association tournament and in the high school region tournament so um we we just try to put everything in yeah in one place that is going on at least the major type of uh, uh, of events i i hope that answered the question any other uh, kind of comments to that guys All right, so um, then, yeah, the next question was, are, are like, any changes to the bid process that have changed this year? Um, we currently don't have any changes to the bid process um, right now. We are more probably worried about, uh, about just getting tournaments going sooner rather than later here in the short term. We, um, the teams that were scheduled to host the events um, this summer, that have been postponed to the fall are still scheduled to host. And we will talk about those here in, yeah, in, in a little bit. So um, we have not set out the, like, the bid process as of now. And then the last question is, is there a single person on point for particular events? For example, Allie for Spinlop, Taylor for NGO Qualls, et cetera. Does anybody, else, yeah, does anybody want to take that? There is no specific person for the, for the uh, kind of for the various events. There will be different people that are going to be in charge of the bid process. So that'll be the, there'll be different people in each events process, whether it's from scheduling to, to uh, like the bid process or collecting of the tournament kind of, kind of entry fees. So this is a kind of, kind of a new committee and we're trying to figure things out. And as we go through events, things will change as, yeah, yeah, just as needed. So. So the next thing on our agenda here, again, please, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A feature. Um, so what's up with the NGO calls and tags for this upcoming fall? I think Taylor, aren't you gonna be kind of hosting, aren't you scheduled to host tags at, at, at Southside? Yes, um, that's correct. So we have um, requested or bid to host tags. Um, for uh, for this fall, so we are looking at at hosting it now. Um, we're kind of at the mercy of uh, the Pearland Auditorium, uh, our local governing bodies on what we're allowed to do in terms of hosting tournaments, having um, large capacity of people within the auditorium or even within the area. Uh, are they going to allow us to play? So um, we are coordinating with, uh, like I said local officials as well as people at the Pearland Natatorium to try and determine if we're going to even be able to feasibly host um, the tournament. It, it falls a lot um, on a lot of different factors. Um, like I said, number one, are we even eligible to host it? Two, we also have to think about, um, about uh, kind of profitability off of the tournament as well. We can put a tournament out there and hope that people will show up, but if teams aren't willing to travel, or uh, athletes are worried about it, parents are not wanting kids to have close contact, it kind of limits our ability to host the tournament and actually make it a successful event. So, so as of right now, all the Southwest Zone events or kind of run events, the NGO quals are still scheduled. Um, and that right now is the 14 and 1200 quals are scheduled for the Armadillo Classic in late September. Um, uh, and then there is the 18 and 16 and under qual scheduled at the Shark Fest in early October. The Armadillo Classic in late September is scheduled for North Texas and hosted by Thunder. The 18 and 16 under quals is scheduled for Houston in early October um, and hosted by, by, yeah, by the Cypher Water Polo Club. So that's still on. Um, as, I mean, as far as the National Junior Olympics that are happening, that is still on and they are still planning on hosting that event. Um, if there are, I mean, things do change as everybody knows, um, uh, we will change accordingly at, at like, as we move forward. But I mean, I'm, I, I'm gonna throw a question out to the group here. I mean, do you feel that your club is ready to start competing at this point? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll agree with Taylor. Uh, also, no, we have not been able to get in the pool since, oh my goodness. I don't, I don't want to say the day. I think March. Yeah, I was like, Allie, weren't you March or April? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And I know for us specifically, we were allowed back in the pool for a short period of time. Then we were, uh, we were kind of quarantining as a club. And then we were told that we were no longer allowed in the facility. Um, and that's just because the entire facility was shut down. So um, yeah, we're, we're not ready right now. I think we have a mixed bag of, of kids that would love to compete. Um, and then I think there's some that are parents would be tentative. Um, you know, that being said, we've been training um, seven days a week since the beginning of June, so without interruption. So the kids are getting a little antsy. Brandon? Yeah, for us, I mean, we've, we've been back in the water full time for a week now. Um, so, and, and right now we're running one out of our normal three sites. Um, so I would say, yeah, sure, we could compete at what kind of level, uh, I don't know. It, it, it wouldn't be pretty. So, um, yeah, no, right now as a club, we're, we're not ready for anything. Yeah, and, and I believe that throughout the zone, there, um, it's, well, there's not very many clubs that are, I mean, there are, there are some clubs that aren't even practicing yet. And the clubs that are practicing, we use the majority of school district Oh, run pool. So a lot of people just started and they're under heavy social distancing guidelines and there are, is not scrimmaging going on. There we have like, like there might be some, uh, some of some, you know, some social distancing scrimmage, but there's not full contact, full throttle playing going on at this point. Um, and I know I've talked to a lot of uh, like, you know, facilities and such and, I don't think they're, I don't think they're ready to let people start doing those things yet. And I mean, even non school district kind of kind of run facilities that may have less restrictions. So, I mean, at, like we are going to try to keep, and we did cancel the events here uh, a couple of weeks ago in August. Um, like the beach water pole one that's run by Zillow, the welcome to Texas shootout that is in, yeah, that is in early September. The Dallas, they had the Dallas summer classic, which was scheduled for early August. We are hoping to have these events at the end of September, at the beginning of October, but we are going, we're not going to cancel them unless we get to that point that we have to. And I mean, and at this point, we just don't know. And there are way too many questions out there. So. I mean, I, my club's got probably the, the best situation, um, but there's no way we could run any, any games or anything like that. Um, we're able to shoot and pass at one facility and which is a private, outdoor um, small six lane shallow deep pool. And then we got access to SMU's indoor facility, but there it's, you know, one kid per lane, temperature checks, no balls, lane ropes in. So it's essentially a swim practice. So it's the varying degrees that we, we have to deal with. And it's all controlled by the facilities. Um, and I don't know if you mentioned this, Joe, but a lot of the facilities managers don't really have control over what they're allowing. It's coming from higher up. And basically, it's a fine line of trying to push them um, to let you do more yep. and getting to the point where they just want to kick you out. So right now, we're just having access to a pool is the best thing that we can do. Exactly. And I mean, I'm, I'm encouraging, I mean, and I'm encouraging teams if they can do a, like a little bit of ultimate water pole, like a social distancing scrimmage, and then slowly, slowly build up to scrimmaging. But that's only if your facility is going to allow it and you feel comfortable as a club doing it. So there's also other things besides just going to play games. There's also the travel involved and such. So there's a lot of pieces t to this puzzle. So, um, and we all know that there will be water pole tournaments again, and there will be water pole games again. We, and I think we all would love to see this earlier, Oh, rather than later, but it's one of those things where uh, we're just going to be safe and responsible, kind of, kind of moving forward with we are kind of, kind of with the with the decisions. So there are a couple questions in our Q and A here. Or um, so uh, number one uh, was any best practices for scheduling games and such that you can provide. Yes, we can provide it. Please, please feel free to email Joe Linehan at usawaterpolo.org, and I'd be happy to help and provide any teams that are that are looking to to. Uh, yeah, to have those that the yeah, yeah to have any questions about scheduling, we can help with other terms besides just this like the Southwest Zone run events. Um, we also have some information on at TXWaterPolo.com, 
and we are working on a new endeavor called called the called the Texas Water Polo um, Academy, and that'll be coming online here hopefully by the end of, uh, like by the end of this month, which will have those type of uh, kind of resources on it. So um, the, the next question was with the national championships canceled. Oh, kind of when are the ODP zone team trainings for the Southwest zone? Um, I think whenever they say the national championships canceled, I believe that they meant the ODP national championships canceled. So um, now, uh, so there was a new schedule of ODP that came out this year. And um, I do know that uh, Spencer is part of the ODP coaching staff, but um, there is a camp in Austin slash San Antonio in September. It's normally on, on, on September 20th. It's still scheduled accordingly. There is one in, I believe it's October 18th in Houston. And then over Thanksgiving weekend, there is one in North Texas. So there's three ODP camps this year as a, like, and they are now spread out uh, kind of just once a month. And as, and as of right now, I do believe that they are um, still scheduled. Is that correct, Spencer? Yeah, that's correct. They're still on the schedule, um, still planned, obviously. Um, as soon as we, you know, learn more and as things change, we'll, we'll update uh, the schedule and, and that will be reflected on the calendar. Okay. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, so now, um, uh, like the next question is the, the, the reality is if we do try to, to, to get a do quals and pay for entry, then if JOs gets canceled, then what? Well, if JOs does get canceled, all entry fees are going to be um, uh, refunded. So it's that they're not going to keep that. So, um, and as far as, I mean, that's as a club, if you decide that you want to go and make that trip to go out to JOs, we all know that if you make a trip and plans at this, at this point in our society, it, there is a, always going to be that chance that there might be some cancellation. So um, I would just uh, suggest to clubs that you um, get refundable hotels and get refundable uh, like kind of plane tickets. So um, just to be on the, on the safe side, if that's what your club the uh, kind of decides to do. Any other thoughts on that, guys? Joe, I know for us specifically, we've sent out a survey to our athletes and our parents to try and gauge interest for JOs um, since it has changed. Uh, I have heard from some of our parents who there was a, a great Southwest Airlines uh, deal on flights out to California earlier this summer. And so they jumped on that and bought plane tickets early. But thank goodness they're refundable and or yep. uh, can be transferred. So they've been using that uh, feature for the unknown of what's going on. Um, we have for Southside, we have a hotel block already set up, um, different things like that ready to go. But like you said, it, uh, it's uh, cancelable, right? Uh, we're able to get out of the contract if we need to, if things were to, uh, were to not work out with JOs. Um, same with the entry fees being removed. If we ended up uh, deciding not to go, we'd get the refund uh, on the entry fee, and then we would redistribute that back out to our families who had paid into it. So. Okay. Any other thoughts from the club admin coach's perspective, guys? All right, so the next question here is, uh, any thoughts on, on, a uh, on a threshold level of actively of, of practicing clubs that would determine J.O. crawls as viable? Um, I mean, it's one of those things where if J.O.s is still going to be kind of going on, we, we will have to have a J.O. crawls at a certain time, and we will open that up and see who wants to enter. Once we know that, then we are going to contact the – participating teams and determine, all right, if it's only one team per uh, a, a division, well, we probably won't have a qualifier for that division. But if there's two or three teams, then we'll probably talk. So it's going to be depending on each division and, and it might be slightly different. So just, um, I mean, it's, again, it's, that's, that, that's a big what if type question. So um, it's, I know I've talked to a lot of different clubs and, the answers nowadays are a lot different than the answers were back in June. Back in June, I would have heard from all the clubs and they said, yes, I want to go and we're going to JOs. Nowadays, a little bit, everybody's a bit more hesitant. Um, I think we've been through a lot here as a, as a society and the number of cases go up. So it's not that the coaches are more hesitant. It's just that they just have a feeling for their clubs and they may not be ready to travel at this point. So we will see as soon as we know, and then we'll get the, get the qualifier kind of information out to everybody and we will then see who wants to actually uh, play. So there you go. 
Thoughts on that, guys? No, I think that's right on. Um, do you know what the age requirements for NGOs for 18-year-olds specifically will be? I know it used to be age as of August 1st. Does anybody else want to answer this? Yeah. Just for, for, for the National the National Junior Olympics, the age group is, all, is still going to be August 1 of 2020. So you could have a 15-year-old that turns 15 in October play at NGOs for the 14 and under division. All right. And the same thing for the 18 and, and under division as well. So now for those athletes that are going off to college and playing, they will be eligible if, they're, if their home club wants them to play. And also if they're playing for an NCAA team, their coach at that NCAA team will have to be on, will, yeah, will have to allow that player to play as well. They have to have a, like, it's, it's just, it's on an individual case by case basis because every school and every kid is going to have a different situation. But it's going to be August 1 of 2020. And those athletes that did turn 19, but they graduated in uh, May or June of, 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 of 2020, but they already turned 19, they are still also going to be eligible for the National Junior Olympics as well. So, so just to clarify, in the 18U division, there, can, there probably will be 19-year-olds in the 18U division? Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then the last question in the Q&A is, could clubs putting an event on for the first time get help from this group? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, yeah, this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is what the group is for, is to help. It's not just the Southwest Zone run events, but it's also anybody else that is out there kind of hosting events. Um, and, and I believe that the one thing I think that we're, that we're really strong here in our zone is people help each other out. And uh, was it, um, and I mean, I know I've gotten, I've like, I've, like, I've sent emails and schedules out to, out to people on this committee to take a look before I send it out to people. And I know people on this committee have also, and you know, has have also kind of sent me their schedules as well. So, I mean, we're, we're, although water has grown a whole lot in Texas and in the Southwest zone, we still have a long way to go and we're still a very small group. So. Please, yes, we are more than happy to help out any way possible. So now, um, I mean, what type of changes are coming in 2021 and 2022? Does anybody want to tackle that question? Well, high school championships is moving from the spring to the fall. Yep. Um, I know that we have discussed, I think we're going to implement a TAGS uh, fall championship. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two two biggest things. Um, so anyone else want to add to that? I mean, as I, like, as Spencer just said, there will be the first EYL kind of, kind of high school season in fall 2021. So in 2021, there's actually gonna be two high school seasons. Tisco water polo spring 2021 and also fall like, and then the fall UIL season. After that, there's gonna be no more spring high school water polo. So just 2020 was be very unique because we're going to have two high school seasons. We're going to have two tags championships. Then in the spring of 2022, it's going to be, that's just going to be club events. So we'll actually have a tags spring championship for, for the 14 and 12 and under kids. And then we're going to have a tags fall championship for the eighth grade and the sixth grade and under kids. So that's where we're going. The more, yeah, the more tournaments, the, yeah, yeah, the better. So. I just answered, and I just answered your question, uh, Robert. So I didn't even see it. So there you go. Um, so now, uh, kind of, all right. So as you guys are kind of on this committee now, what type of specific challenges do you see kind of coming up, kind of for the committee after we get back and playing here um, in 2020 or throughout 2021? Um. I'll, I'll start. I think the, the big one right now is that, um, right, we haven't participated in an event because of COVID. So us getting experience and kind of working together, we're not able to do that. Um, right now, it's kind of all a theoretical working thing. And then we haven't been able to practice actually running an event together, having five people 
communicate and make sure things work in a good way. Um, so it's going to kind of be once we have our first tournament, then and we get more experienced and work with each other, then, you know, everything's going to run smoothly. But for now, it's just we're not able to actually practice that and run an event together. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think um, not that it has been a problem, but just making sure that the communication um, and that, that all the things that get done need to get need to get done get done, and that we're not expecting one person to do one thing and it slips through the cracks. So um, so far, it's been great. I think the communication we've had with the group has been awesome. So I don't anticipate it being a problem, but that's also one of the biggest challenges I see. Brandon, Taylor? Yeah, I, think, I think that we just want to make sure that we are accessible to um, those throughout the zone, those who have questions, those who uh, want to put on events, who maybe haven't put on an event yet or are uh, seeking to put on more events throughout the year. Uh, like you said, we are a zone where we really try to help each other out all the time and find ways to uh, work across the zone with one another. So um, just knowing that we are accessible, you can ask any one of us a question and we will find the answer for you or work to find the answer for you as easily as possible. Um, Cause we want to be that sounding board for the zone to help out. Okay. Brandon. Yeah, I think the, the only real challenge as we get back rolling is just going to be the, the various parts of the zone who starts rolling at this time, who starts rolling at this time and, and how do we kind of manage, um, you know, the, the four or five different areas of Texas all getting going again and being able to participate in the events. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some challenges. Sure. But um, I mean, this committee um, is designed, this is, this committee is very unique to the Southwest zone. There's no other zones that have us out there that have an events committee and the people that are on this committee, they are, they are very well versed. They've played in, they played in these events. They have coached in these events. They have hosted these events. So um, you're in, in very good hands kind of moving forward. So, and I'm very actively kind of, kind of looking forward to seeing um, like the events in like, you know, three, four, five years down the line. So um, because these events, as our zone keeps growing, these events are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, just like a big, uh, like a big decision that was um, made a couple years ago was we, split our NGO calls. We, yeah, instead of everybody being on one weekend, we had to go to two weekends because it was just getting too big. So, um, and those type of things are going to be, go, are going to be going forward. Like we, as like this committee has made the decision to have two tax tournaments instead of just one. Again, just let, yeah, kind of, kind of let's just provide more championships for that younger age because they are the future. So um, I am very much kind of looking forward to seeing what this committee is going to be able to do. So um, some, some questions here from the Q&A. Who, overse who oversees to keep events from overlapping? Um, that's that's going to be, that's a counter question. That's probably going to fall on Spencer Dornan. Um, and it's not necessarily to keep events from overlapping, but it's going to be doing our best to keep events from overlapping. Because if a coach wants to host an event on this weekend and, and a, 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 another coach wants to do the same thing, we're going to try to make sure that that doesn't happen, but it might still happen. So, but um, we are also trying to get the counter out as early as possible um, to make sure that people know and they can and they and they can reference it to make sure that they don't try to host on those same weekends because we want kids to be able to play in their local game days as well as all as as all the tournaments. Spencer, yeah, I would just say um, please reference the the calendar. We're going to keep that up to date as much as possible um, and be looking for free weekends if you're looking to host an event. Um, obviously. If there's a high school, then there's no problem hosting a age under age event on the same weekend. Um, but you do have to take into account many of the high school coaches coach the younger kids too, and so that always becomes a challenge when we're looking to schedule referees and having coaches and things like that. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, kind of one more question here is: Is there an alias for the group as a whole, or should folks reach out to? Yeah, to folks kind of the like individually. Um, as, yeah, for right now, you can feel free to reach out individually to the various uh, people on the committee. But we were talking today about an alias to have a Southwest Zone Events Committee email. So we are working on that and we will get that out to the group here soon. Right, Taylor? 
Yes. Yeah. I'm working on it right now. So there you go. So, um, and any other questions for the committee, please again, feel, feel, yeah, just kind of feel free to ask via the Q and a feature. Um, while we have this group of people together, they've all gone to, to the National Junior Olympics. I wanted to take the opportunity to ask them a couple of specifics about the National kind of Junior Olympics because this is a great event that USA Water Polo puts on every year. Um, and we have sent teams from the Southwest Zone each and every year. Like 10 years ago, there was one club that sent eight teams. Now in the summer of 2019, we had 12 clubs that sent 45 total teams. So um, I'm just gonna go around the horn real quick and ask, how many teams did your club send and in, in, uh, in what age groups and, um, and uh, kind of what your experience was at the summer of 2019 kind of, kind of NGOs. So let's go, Brandon. Uh, yeah, so last year, honestly, we sent so many that I, I don't totally recall. I think we sent 11, um, which is probably good that I, I don't recall, but um, yeah, we sent all all divisions, uh, all age groups for boys, uh, and then we had silver teams as well, or what we call silver teams, um, kind of our second teams in that age group. Um, and then on the girls' side, um, I think we sent 14, 16s, 18s, and then um, a second 18 girls team. Um, and yeah, it's it's always a great experience. Like we have kids that that may go on that second team the next year uh, and become first team players you know, the following, the following season, um, I've coached everything from, you know, kids that have, that have finished top 20, uh, in platinum to kids that didn't win a single game. So, um, and had outstanding experiences with, with both groups. Um, so yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's a great experience for the kids. It, um, if they'd never been, it's something that I kind of feel like um, obviously that's kind of the crescendo of our season. That's what we build towards all year. Um, but we have kids that may come in and, you know, March or April start playing. Um, we've got a spot available that, that they hop on and, and from their, their hook, they become lifers. And as soon as we get off the, you know, we won't even get off the plane. We'll still be in California waiting to get on the plane and they they can't wait to come back next year. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty rad experience for the coaches, for the kids, for everybody. So. Allie. Longhorn Aquatics. Yes. So for Longhorn last year, we had 16 and 18 new boys, and we had our first ever 16 new girls team, which I'm really proud of. Um, and we had 18 new girls. And then we also sent 10s, 12s, and I think maybe a 14 um, kids to play with other teams. So uh, we, we had four of our own teams, but I think we were represented almost in every age group. Um, and I mean, it's, it's the big, kind of like what Brandon said, it's the big tournament that you train towards. It's like a tangible end goal. So in practice, so you can keep referencing like, you know, work hard, this is going to come into play at JOs and make sure you're doing this like teams, whenever you're out at JOs, it's really important that you get this one skill, right? Because those teams out there, they're going to expose that weakness. Right. Um, and I think what, what's really cool about it is they really, it's, the fun, right? It's fun. And then at the end of summer, they want to keep playing and they want to keep going back. And our goal is always to become more competitive. And then while we're out of JOs, surprise a few teams. So if they're like, you know, who the heck is Longhorn Aquatics, then, and then we beat them, then we, you know, we did our goal. So it's always a fun trip and I really love it. Well, Taylor, Southside. Um, let's see. So with Southside last year, we sent a 14, 16, and 18 boys team. Um, and then we also sent a 14 girls and 18 girls team. Um, I mean, I, I love going out to JOs. Um, I've been out as a player. I've been out as a coach now. Uh, it is one of the coolest experiences to go out there. Um, but the thing I really love about it is the kids who go out there and then bring it back home. Um, they bring back those skills. They bring back those stories, those memories um, to kids who may not have gone out uh, that year or who uh, just didn't have the time or a family vacation planned. And then you hear of those kids that like that next weekend being like, yeah, my family has a vacation plan next year, but I told them to push it off a week so that we can go out to JOs. Like we're already planning this for next year. So it really just, um, they bring the skills back and they bring back all of this like positive energy and it really helps drive into your fall season. Even when you take a couple weeks off to just give the coaches a break, give the kids a break. 
uh, they still come back super pumped a couple weeks later and uh, ready to work hard. Spencer with Pegasus. Yeah, we, um, we took three teams out there um, and we sent kids to other clubs as well. So we had a 14s boys, a 12s boys, and we sent our first uh, girls team, a 12U girls team, which was awesome. Um, it, just to add on to whatever else, so the kids love it. Um, they have a great time. I mean, we went from barely having the 14s last year to having, you know, three teams this year or this last year. And then um, we had a really strong um, interest prior to, prior to COVID hitting. So, um, yeah, the kids love it. They, like they said, they, they really drives home the excitement of water polo. They get to see, um, you know, players that, you know, that they're stronger than that they thought maybe they, they weren't from different areas and as well as, um, you know, see what the level they need to get to. So it's exciting. It's always a measuring stick of where you are as a club. And, um, yeah, I can't, can't say enough good things about it. Yeah. I also love the National County Junior Olympics. I know I brought teams out there for 15 straight years. I, I haven't coached at JOs for, for three years, so I feel a, like a, a little out of the loop. But it is a wonderful tournament. There is the biggest water polo tournament in the world. Um, and one thing that I believe in a couple of the coaches here kind of kind of touched on it was the kids that come back, they are invested. They are set. They are waving the, like they are waving the water polo flag. And they get their buddies to come out because they want them to come – to, to the tournament of late, like the following year, just helps build the growth back here in the Southwest zone. And I know all, like all clubs and teams have different goals going out to JOs. And there's three main categories. There's the teams that are, gonna, that are going out there to try to win the tournament. There's, a, there's the teams that, you know, that are successful just the moment they step foot off the airplane because they're actually going for the first time. And then there's going to be the majority of the teams are going out there to win, win. Yeah. Kind of to win, win possible. And, you know, but I still have a good positive experience and you just clubs and athletes and parents just focus on that positive experience because it is such a very good experience kind of for the kids. And it really is something for the end of the summer to work for, or in this case, the end of the fall and winter to work towards. Um, and we are hoping to have, you know, uh, JOs here in uh, November, December, but also next summer as well. And, um, and, you know, and it truly invests those athletes it gives them something to do but it also gives and they become much more invested it's not just the athletes but it's also the parents and then they get to see all these players and meet people from around the country it is truly a great experience so um i appreciate kind of you guys kind of sharing about the national and junior olympics and uh, and your clubs uh, i appreciate you guys being on are there any more questions from the from the audience here before we get off, I just want to say that for anybody who doesn't know, Joe has really been uh, doing all of our roles for the past forever. Um, so he has been communications, he has been calendar, he's been finance, he's been bid packets, you name it. He's been running all of it. And it is, it is a hard job. It is a rigorous process. And he's really done a great job of making sure that we're all kind of put into roles um that are going to make it successful with the, within the zone but a lot of this has to do with just like him making it successful and him creating uh these opportunities for our zone to grow but it wouldn't happen without his hard work and doing so much for us so thanks joe taylor thank you so much that was so nice <laughs> and to think that whenever i coach you you want me to uh not yeah to never see me again at times so there's some <laughs> choice words i used to have for you joe okay there you go but i mean no but it does take a village to run these events and whenever we first started kind of running these events there were only one or two a year but now that they've grown it's become a partnership with the clubs the hosts and now this Southwest Zone Events Committee is just that next phase. And this is really going to allow our tournaments to take it to the next level. And I am very much kind of looking forward to getting back in the pool and seeing you guys on the pool deck. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, uh, what is it? Um, we are going to take a Zoom break here. Um, there are be no town hall meetings or Texas coach coaches until September 2020. We, we will send a schedule to everyone here in mid-August. But all previous uh, Southwest Zone town hall meetings and this one and all previous – uh, Texas coaches to coaches sessions have been posted at the TXWaterPole.com website. 
Um, thank you so much uh, for coming on today. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and hit, click the stop record. Yeah, thanks everybody and take care. All right, see you guys.